Good morning. The meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice, Business and Financial Operations Committee is called to order in accordance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, the Open Meetings Act. A quorum of the committee is present and the meeting is now declared open. It is 9.05 a.m. Uh, first order of business is approval of the minutes. Are there any amendments or objections to the proposed minutes as presented? Hearing none, the minutes as presented on the agenda will stand approved. Our first order of business on the agenda, uh, Mr. Steffa, are you here? Yes, sir. Okay. I think the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you. And, and good morning, Chair Dayella, Chairman O'Daniel, board members. Uh, I would like to thank you for all the time that you took during our individual briefings to go over the fiscal year 21 budgets. Uh, we were able to go over it in detail and answer all of your questions. And I appreciated your time and, and enjoyed uh, briefing you on the budget. Uh, and I would also like to thank Rebecca Waltz and her budget team for all of the hard work that they put into the budget. Uh, you know, typically we would be bringing before you today both the legislative appropriations request as well as the operating budget. Uh, since the legislative appropriations request instructions haven't been issued, today we'll be just presenting the operating budget and we'll present that appropriations request at a later time. Uh, you know, the COVID pandemic has really impacted many areas of the operations and, and budget is no exception to that. Uh, in May, state leadership issued a letter requesting the agencies to submit a plan to reduce their budgets by 5%. Uh, given the importance of critical governmental functions, exemptions were included. For TDCJ, that included correctional security, correctional managed health care, and behavioral health programs. And the budget that we're going to be presenting today. <laughs> The legislative appropriations uh, is consistent with what the decisions made by the legislature last session, as well as it includes those 5% reductions. The reductions include closing two prison facilities, the Garza East unit, as well as the Jester unit, and the idling of Bradshaw State Jail. The current offender populations allowed for those closings, and staff were offered the ability to transfer to positions at nearby facilities. The reductions also included a managed hiring freeze, reduction in operating costs, agency capital, information technology programs. The correctional information technology system was one of those uh, IT programs, and that system would have replaced the offender mainframe. And we look forward to requesting those funds in the future for that much needed system. Um, after the $122.9 million in biennial reductions are reduced from the biennial uh, budget, the fiscal year 21 budget totals $3.38 billion. Uh, the fiscal challenges that we will address going forward include correctional officer staffing, uh, the Correctional Managed Healthcare Committee, as well as the uncertainties that relate to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, given the importance of the state's response to the, the, the pandemic, the agency will continue to exercise prudent fiscal management moving forward into fiscal year 21. Uh, we will be bringing the agency operating budget for you uh, during the meeting's regular session. And I just thank you so much for your support of the agency. Thank you, Mr. Steffa. Um, is there, uh, is that, is that the, the report on the budget? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We have a we have a couple of other other items. I think um, are you are you presenting on those as well, or is Mr. Mr. Lumpkin maybe? Yes. Okay. Sir. First Perfect. item. Thank you so much. Any questions, anybody? I know we've had a chance to do this one on one, but okay. All right, let's move on. Um. Mr. Lumpkin, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, all right, you have a couple of items for us today. 
Yes, sir, that's correct. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Chairman O'Daniel, Mr. Call, your members. Today, we have two items on the agenda. During the regular session of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice meeting, we will recommend that the board approve both. First item is a request for right of way easements at the Styles Unit in Jefferson County. Jefferson County is requesting easement and easements which include a total of less than half an acre of land for a right of way access at two different points that the county owns. The map that you see depicted in January of 90, Jefferson County donated 689 acres of land for the use and benefit of TDCJ to construct a correctional facility. They are now requesting right of way easement to reach approximately 100 acres of county land that became deadlocked with this do donation. The land that's in the, that is that we're mentioning is if you look at the Styles unit and east of the Styles unit, you see a complex that's not that's not tagged on the map. That is a former youth facility. The land in between the Styles, the yellow border, and that facility is around 100 acres. They have contracted with Lamar University to set up a commercial driving school in that 100 acres. So at this point, they're needing access off of FM 3514 to access that land. They have agreed to pay $5,000 for this easement with a 10-year term. The easement does include language requiring indemnification as the grantee's responsibility and the most favored nation clause. I'm available for any question. This easement, you know, unlike the pipeline easements, this doesn't affect our operations and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a, it, it, it's neutral to us, right? Yes, sir. That is correct. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about that easement? All right. Moving on to the next one, Mr. Lumpkin. Yes, sir. The second item is a request for an electrical transmission easement at the Montford unit in Lubbock County. Encore Electric Delivery Company is requesting an easement, which includes an area of approximately 18.99 acres of land being 7,389.46 feet long by variable width for two electrical transmission lines. The request includes a temporary workspace totaling less than two acres of land. Please direct your attention to the screen. The Montford unit uh, sits off of Highway 84, uh, just south of Lubbock. The, there's the two different lines. You see the one line is right off of 84 as you enter our land. And then just south of the unit, I, I guess that, well, the other one is actually east. The other line running south of the unit uh, traverses through our land east to west. They have agreed to pay $117,894 for this easement with a 10-year term. The easement does include indemnification as the grantee's responsibility, the most favored nation clause, and minimum amount of insurance of at least $2 million. I'm available for any questions. Again, as to, as to uh, this easement, doesn't affect our operations at all, does it? That's correct, sir. No, okay. no impact on operations. And so this is for a 10-year term. So. Uh, after 10 years, we, we, they either abandon it or we collect another fee. Right. We renego renegotiate another term. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for spearheading that. Yes, sir. Uh, anything else? No, sir. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Next on our agenda are our projects. Bear with me. Okay, I've got it in my tab. Okay, and who's here to present on that? Uh, this is Cody Gensel, sir. Hello, Mr. Gensel. How are you today? I'm doing good, Mr. Chairman. How are you, good. sir? Good. All right, take it away. All righty. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Chairman O'Daniel, Mr. Collier, members. I'd like to provide an update on the status of board approved projects. We'll start with item number one, the gesture four uh, roofing project. This project is currently 76% complete. Contractor has completed the main building roof replacement and is currently working on an adjacent housing roof. Item number two is the pilot unit roofing project. This project is currently 78% complete. Contractor has completed the roof replacement for blocks one through three and is currently working on the medical building roof. 
Item number three for the Hughes unit design only for roof replacement. This design is currently at 14% complete. Item number four is the Coalfield unit roofing project. This project is currently at 3% complete. The contractor has delivered materials to the job site, established a construction yard, and is working on gravel removal from the existing roof. Item number five is the Michael unit roofing project. This project is currently at 2% complete. Contractor is mobilized to the job site is in establishing a construction yard. Item number six is a young roofing project. This project is currently 2% complete. Contractor has also delivered materials to the job site, established a construction yard, and is working on a gravel removal for the existing roof. The next two items are seven and eight are to replace the plumbing controls and fixtures at the Ellis and Estelle units. The Ellis unit project is currently a 68% complete and the Estelle unit project is currently a 55% complete. These are intelligent conservation or that what we call the ICON projects that are being completed by the facilities division in-house maintenance staff. We change the slide. Item number nine is the bird unit project to replace the locking system on A and C cell blocks. Project is currently a 50% complete. Contractor has completed installation on the A cell block and is now working on C. Item number 10 is a Lindsay unit project to replace the locking system. This project is currently at 10% complete. Uh, the contractor has built all locking mechanisms offsite and is now in the facility for the installation phase. Item number 11 is the pack unit project to install air conditioning. This project is currently at 99% complete. Installation of the air conditioning for the housing area was completed as of April the 1st, 2020. And the electrical upgrade portion of the project uh, has also been completed by the facilities division in-house maintenance. And the project is now in punch list phase. Item number 12 is a Hodge unit project to install air conditioning. A notice to proceed has been issued and the project is currently 1% complete. The contractor is mobilized to set up a construction yard and is beginning the initial phase of the project. Item number 13 is the Mountain View project to replace the water distribution lines. Project is currently at 95% complete. Contractors connected all buildings to the new water line system and is working on the final phase of the project. Item number 14 is the Mountain View project to replace the groundwater storage tank. This project is currently at 99% complete and is now in the punch list phase. Item number 15 is the Ferguson unit design only for the replacement of the water treatment plant. This design is currently at 15% complete. And lastly, item number 16 is the wind unit project to replace the primary electrical distribution system. This project is currently at 41% complete. Contractor is currently ahead of schedule and continues to work on boring holes for pulling of new lines, as well as building of concrete pads for new transformers. This concludes my project status update. I'll stand by for any questions you may have. So the, the gesture four uh, project, the first one is, is really the one where uh, we've, we've had a considerable amount of delays for a number of reasons. And I understand there's been discussions with the contractor about, right. um, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities on their part and, and, and changes in, in the project that were uh, discussed between, uh, between the agency and, and the contractor. Um, so, so that one's that project is is one that looks like it's going to be delayed the most. Any com any any anything else to add on that? Yes, sir. Um, certainly, with some weather delays in that area. But what we found is when we removed the old roof, the subdecking, the concrete uh, base of that uh, was extremely damaged and wet. Uh, that was not uh, detailed in the initial scope of work to that extent. So it's taking them longer to go back in uh, and dry that and then add an additional uh, roofing line uh, where they're adding on top of the PVC polyvinyl chloride uh, roof. So uh, to dry that out, and of course with the weather, uh, that's played a part in drying that out as well. So, so that's- And, and that plan project. going forward on how to, to get through that, that's all been dealt with? Yes, sir. Uh, we, we had regular meetings with the contractor, Texas uh, Liquid Tech, uh, they're one of our better contractors. They provide a good quality service when they're completed. Uh, this project is uh, unfortunately is delayed simply because of the of that roof line and then some subcontractor issues uh, in relation to COVID as well as 
materials uh, because of COVID. Uh, we've, we've had some difficulties in that area as well. Okay. Well, the, that was the only uh, question or comment I had on this, if there are any others. Uh, hearing none, thank you, Mr. Gensel, appreciate it. Yes, sir, thank you. And that concludes our business. The meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice Business and Financial Operations Committee is now adjourned. It is 921. The meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice Audit and Review Committee is called to order in accordance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, the Open Meetings Act. A quorum of the committee is present and the meeting is now declared open. It is 9. 30 a.m. Um, first order of business approval of the minutes. Everybody's received a copy of the minutes from August 2019. Are there any amendments or objections to the minutes as presented? Hearing no meet, hearing no um, objections, uh, the meetings as presented on the agenda will stand approved. We have one presenter today that is um, well known to us all, Chris Sarita, the Director of the Internal Audit Division. He's first gonna give us a quick review of the Internal Audit Report for fiscal year 2020. And then we're gonna have a video presentation from our Media Services Department on our second um, item uh, of business, and that is the proposed fiscal year 2021 annual audit plan. Director Cerrito, are you ready to go? Okay. Click your unmute, Mr. C there we go. How about now? There you go. Okay, very good. Good morning members and Judge Francis. This morning, I have one update to your status report that is in your packet. That one update is audit 2006 has now been issued as a final report. And that is all of the updates to the status report for 2020. And I will pause for any questions you may have related to that report. Okay, well, if there are no questions, next up, we have the presentation of the proposed fiscal year 21 annual audit plan. As you know, this year we presented a video. Um, the video as it plays, one of the things that I would like to remind the board members and any of the public watching, that in any case in which you see staff or offenders not wearing personal protective equipment, that footage was taken prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, if you would, please start the video. Good morning. As I begin this morning, I would like to take a moment to personally express my gratitude and the gratitude of the Internal Audit Division to all of the men and women who have served the great state of Texas during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. I would also like to take a moment to personally thank the Internal Audit Division staff. As many of you know, the Internal Audit Division staff traveled to 47 different prison units, multiple administrative offices, and several Board of Pardons and Parole offices to personally thank the thousands of men and women for the work that they do on a daily basis. We will now move to an overview of the Internal Audit Division, a brief discussion of the guiding legislation and standards we must follow, the development of the annual audit plan, and the presentation of the plan itself. Upon completion of the presentation of the plan, I will pause for any questions the board may have.
In accordance with Texas Board of Criminal Justice Policy 1402, internal audit is overseen by the Chief Audit Executive who reports directly to the Board of Criminal Justice. The Board of Criminal Justice Chairman appoints an audit and review committee that reviews issues related to internal audit, including the development and recommendation for full board approval of the annual audit plan and the appointment, dismissal, and evaluation of the Chief Audit Executive. Internal Audit is responsible for examining and evaluating the adequacy and effectiveness of the agency's system of internal controls and the quality of agency's carrying out assigned responsibilities. To accomplish this mission, the division performs both financial and performance audits and attestations that use a systematic, disciplined approach to evaluate and improve the effectiveness of risk management, control, and governance processes so TDCJ managers may have assurance related to reliability and integrity of financial and operational information, effectiveness and efficiency of operations, safeguarding of assets, and compliance with laws, regulations, and contracts. Internal audit also provides assistance to management through the review of draft agency policies, service on agency committees, advice to agency management, and completion of special projects based on management request. The division is authorized under several state laws. Chapter 2102 of the Texas Government Code, the Internal Auditing Act. Chapter 491.001 of the Government Code, TDCJ Internal Audit. And Chapter 493.0052 of the Government Code, Organizational Roles and Responsibilities. The most important of these statutes is the Texas Internal Auditing Act. This statute was enacted by the 73rd Legislature with an effective date of September 1, 1993. Key points of the Act include state agencies meeting certain thresholds must employ an internal auditor. These thresholds include any of the following. An annual operating budget of more than $10 million, more than 100 full-time employees, or the agency processes more than $10 million in cash each fiscal year. The Act requires an annual audit plan that is prepared using risk assessment techniques and that identifies the individual audits to be conducted during the year. It also requires periodic audits of the agency's major systems of controls, including accounting systems and controls, administrative systems and controls, and electronic data processing systems and controls. The internal auditor is appointed by the governing board and must be either a certified public accountant or a certified internal auditor. The Governing Board must periodically review the resources of the Division to determine if they are sufficient to address risks identified in the Audit Risk Assessment. The Internal Auditor must report directly to the Governing Board and must also have access to the Agency Administrator and must be free of all operational and management responsibilities that would impair independence. Audit reports must be distributed to management, the full board, the Governor's Budget and Policy Office, the Legislative Budget Board, and the State Auditor's Office. The Internal Audit Program should also conform with standards for the professional practice of internal auditing. The Code of Ethics contained in the Professional Practices Framework, as promulgated by the Institute of Internal Auditors, and generally accepted government auditing standards. And the Audit Department must also conduct quality assurance reviews in accordance with professional standards and periodically take part in a comprehensive external peer review. There are two sets of standards the Division must follow. These are known as the Red Book and the Yellow Book. Both standards follow a similar structure, with the Yellow Book being specifically tailored to governmental operations. For ease of presentation, we will focus on the Red Book, as I believe it does a superior job in describing the profession in layman's terms. The Institute of Internal Auditors International Standards for the Professional Practice of Internal Auditing are divided into three sections. These include mandatory guidance, which includes the core principles, the definition of internal auditing, the code of ethics, and the standards themselves. It also includes recommended guidance, which includes suggestions for implementation of the standards, and then also includes supplemental guidance, and this is guidance issued between revisions of the Red Book due to either a need for clarification or changes in the profession. Next, we will cover the IIA's core principles, which I believe do a great job in summarizing the content of both sets of standards. The core principles require the internal audit function demonstrates integrity, demonstrates competence and due professional care, 
is objective and free from undue influence, also known as independent, aligns with the strategies, objectives, and risks of the organization, is appropriately positioned and adequately resourced, demonstrates quality and continuous improvement, communicates effectively, provides risk-based assurance, is insightful, proactive, and future-focused, and promotes organizational improvement. I would now like to take a moment to introduce you to all of our internal audit staff. Uh, my name is Annabelle Rodriguez. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice, a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish, and I also hold a Master of Arts in Communication Studies. Additionally, I also am a certified interpreter for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. I have a little over five months of auditing experience with the Internal Audit Division. I have approximately five years of experience with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, of which the last two were serving as the Executive Assistant for the Director of the Rehabilitation mm -hmm. Program. Yeah. My name is Maury Puga. Oh, I'm an intern here within the Internal Audit Division. And I'm also a student at Sam Houston State University, and my degree is in accounting. My name is Andrew Kruger. I've been with the Internal Audit Division for two years. I have just shy of 13 years total experience with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from the University of Texas at San Antonio. And my previous position was major of correctional officers at the Garza West Transfer Facility in Beeville. My name is Carlos Davila. I'm a staff auditor with one year of internal audit experience. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice and a Master of Science in Criminal Justice Leadership and Management from Sam Houston State University. Prior to coming to Intern Audit, I was a parole officer with the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles, and I have a total of 11 years of uh, total agency experience. Hello, my name is Charlotte Jeffcoat, and I'm an Audit Manager. I have a Bachelor of Business Administration in Accounting, and I'm a Certified Government Auditing Professional. I have almost 16 years of auditing experience. I've also been working for the agency for almost 16 years, and all of that has been right here within the Internal Audit Division. Hi, my name is Cheryl Foreman, and I'm an audit manager. I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a Juris Doctor. I'm also a certified internal auditor. I have seven and a half years experience auditing and seven and a half years with the agency. Hi, my name is Shinobi Mason. I'm a staff auditor. I have a master's of science in criminal justice. I have two and a half years with the state of Texas and I have six and a half months of service with as an auditor and my previous position before an auditor I was a sergeant at the core unit. Hi I'm Kelsey Kirsch staff auditor. I have a bachelor's of science in psychology and I've been with the agency for four and a half years starting with commissary and trust fund and the last year here in internal audit and I look forward to many more. Hi I'm Christy Bailey. I am the audit manager for the sports services section. I have 19 years with the state and 16 of that has been with the internal audit division. I have a bachelor's of journalism and advertising and I am a certified government auditing professional. Hello, my name is Lori Thomas. I have a bachelor's of science in technical management with a concentration in accounting. I joined the agency in April of 2012 working for the accounts payable department and cashier travel department before I promoted to the Internal Audit Division in March of 2016. I've been auditing for four and a half years. Hi, I'm Lourdes Moreno, Staff Auditor. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Psychology. I have been working for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for almost two years and have been with the Internal Audit Division for six months. Hello, my name is Ricky Poole. I graduated from Sam Houston State University with an Ag Business degree. I have 26 and a half years of service and I worked in uh, as a correctional officer starting in 1992 and then I became a system manager of access to courts and I did that for 16 and a half years and currently I'm a professional auditor with internal audit with five and a half years of service. My name is Robert Harrelson. I'm a staff auditor. I have a BBA in finance from Sam Houston State University. I have four years of audit experience and 22 years of state experience overall. Hi, I'm Stacy Gay. I am a senior audit professional. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology. I have almost 18 years of auditing experience. I have 15 years of experience with the agency to include parole, human resources, and the information technology divisions. Hi, my name is Tyler Cook. I am a senior audit professional here with Internal Audit. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in accounting 
I have nine years of experience with the state. Six of those years have been with internal audit. Previous to that, I was a CEO, a county tech, and purchaser. In addition to my employment with the state, I also have been volunteering with a ministry for the past eight years, and we go into the holiday unit and preach to the inmates there. Hi, my name is Shasha Ismail. I'm currently a student at Sam Houston State University, majoring in criminal justice with a double minor in accounting and management information systems. I'm currently an intern here at the Internal Audit Division. Hi, my name is Trey Marshall Pearson. I have a Bachelor of Arts in English and a minor in criminal justice. I'm also a certified sign language interpreter. I've been with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for approximately two years, and majority has been with the Parole Division. I've been with the Internal Audits Division for approximately three months now. Hello, my name is Renee Russell, and I'm the Deputy Director for Audit Services. I oversee all of the audits, consultations, and follow-up activities that we do in our office. I have a bachelor's degree in journalism. I am a certified government auditing professional and a certified internal auditor. I've been with the agency close to 16 years. Um, I started my career in a mailroom, and I've also worked at facilities division and contracts and procurement department, but I quickly found my home in internal audit division, and I've been with the division for 14 years. My name is Frances Miller, and I am the executive assistant for the internal audit division. I have 19 years with the agency to include correctional institution, information technology, parole and facilities division, as well as the board of parts of parole. I have been with the internal audit division for a total of eight years now. Hello, my name is Kevin Campbell, and I'm the deputy director of support services for the internal audit division. Currently, my responsibilities include uh, our annual ongoing risk assessment for the development of our annual audit plan, our quality assurance, our continuing professional education, and our internship programs. I hold a bachelor's degree in business administration and general business and have 29 years experience with the agency and also nine years of experience in internal auditing. I began my career in 1989 as a correctional officer at the Walls Unit. Throughout my tenure, I've held various positions such as program specialist, auditing positions, program supervisor positions, and managerial positions. Uh, spanning four different divisions to include internal audit, the correctional institutions division, programs and services division, and the administrative review and risk management division. Hi, I'm Chris Cerrito. I am the chief audit executive. I have an undergraduate degree in criminology and corrections and a master's degree in criminal justice leadership and management. I'm a certified internal auditor, a certified fraud examiner, and a certified government auditing professional. I have 25 years with the agency, 22 of which have been with the Internal Audit Division. Next, we will go into the preparation of the annual audit plan. The annual audit plan is developed utilizing a comprehensive agency-wide risk assessment. This risk assessment is carried out by Kevin Campbell, the Internal Audit Division Deputy Director of Support Services. The risk assessment catalogs agency activities based on organizational structure and is based on concepts found in the internal control framework promulgated by the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission, also known as COSO. The annual audit plan is carried out through a systematic and disciplined methodology overseen by Renee Russell, Deputy Director of Audit Services. Our first project, 2101, is our operational review consultation. Currently, the operational review program utilizes 34 functional area checklists consisting of questions developed by each functional area proponent to conduct division, unit, and division level follow-up compliance reviews of unit-based operations on both TDCJ and privately operated units. We will assist management by providing non-audit advisory services during agency efforts to revise methodologies related to the division level compliance review. This would include providing advice related to determining whether the review covers the most important areas and whether the review methodology identifies areas in need of management action. The next project, 2102, Parole Case File Consultation, to address the ongoing transition of physical paper records to electronic records using new and evolving information technologies, the TDCJ created the Record Management Department. 
The first priority of the department is to digitize approximately 173,000 parole case files utilizing a streamlined method of scanning and indexing currently managed by the Central File Coordination Unit of the Parole Division. The TDCJ and the Board of Pardons and Paroles requested we serve as consultants to this project and provide advice related to risks and internal controls. Project 2103 is data management. The Texas Department of Criminal Justice generates and stores large quantities of electronic data. Data storage is facilitated through contractual agreements with the Texas Department of Information Resources on a fee basis. As of June 2020, the Information Technology Division reported 241,075 gigabytes of data stored at a monthly cost of approximately $87,800. In addition to cost associated with data storage, the agency is also responsible for managing data to ensure the data is available when needed and maintained in accordance with state and agency records retention requirements. The objective of this project is to determine the effectiveness of processes to ensure agency data is available, retained for the appropriate period, and stored at the minimum cost necessary for the specific data set. The next project, 2104, is Workforce Diversity. Personnel Directive 10, Workforce Diversity, establishes that the TDCJ recognizes diversity as one of the agency's greatest strengths by enhancing its ability to accomplish the agency's mission and enriching employees both professionally and personally. The directive further acknowledges agency goals to create a positive environment that promotes personal and professional development and attracts new talent, promotes policies, programs, and procedures that value diversity and individual dignity, encourage education about diversity, the development of supportive workplace relationships with others, and leading by example when making decisions related to the workplace, remove barriers hindering progress, and develop leadership that empowers all employees to reach their full potential while contributing to the agency's mission. The objective of this project is to evaluate the effectiveness of agency efforts to achieve the goals listed in Personnel Directive 10. Project 2105, License Plate Factory. Texas Correctional Industries is responsible for manufacturing vehicle license plates in the state of Texas. Original license plate production began at the Huntsville unit in 1935 and relocated to the Wynn unit in 1975. Through an interagency agreement with the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles, the factory manufactures license plates for the state of Texas. The Wynn License Plate Factory employs 12 personnel and approximately 123 offenders. In fiscal year 2019, the License Plate Factory produced a little over 9 million license plates at a contracted amount of approximately $14.5 million. The agency also began producing license plates for the state of Tennessee in May of 2020. This project will be performed in coordination with a similar audit planned by the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles. Our objective is to determine whether the Texas Correctional Industries complies with and maintains accurate financial records related to the interagency agreement with the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles for license plates. 2106 is Wyndham School District Student Contact Hour Tracking. Student attendance records are among the most essential records maintained by the Wyndham School District for reporting, as contact hours are the basis for the district's funding. For fiscal year 2019, the district reported over 12 million contact hours received by students attending both academic and career and technical education programs. The contact hour rates for the 2021 biennium are approximately $4.48 per hour for academic education and $3.67 per hour for career and technical education. The objective is to determine the efficiency of the process to track student contact hours in the Wyndham School District's academic and career technical education programs. Project 2107 is Texas Risk Assessment System Scoring. The Texas Risk Assessment System, or TRAS, is a seamless, evidence-based assessment system that follows an offender through the criminal justice system from community supervision, incarceration, re-entry, and parole supervision. The assessment system interprets an offender's criminal history and determines risk levels related to criminogenic needs and the risk of reoffending. 
Assessment results allow criminal justice pro professionals to devise the most efficient case plans possible for changing behavior and enabling the allocation of supervision resources to best meet the needs of the individual offender. The objective of this project is to determine the effectiveness of efforts to score and assign offenders the appropriate criminogenic risk level within the Texas Risk Assessment System. 2108 is Farm Shop Equipment Repairs. The Manufacturing, Agribusiness, and Logistics Division manages 13 full-scale farm shops and oversees agricultural activities on 24 TDCJ units. The farm shops provide repair and preventative maintenance for a variety of agricultural equipment and fleet vehicles for various departments throughout the TDCJ. For fiscal year 2019, the Manufacturing, Agribusiness, and Logistics Division reported farm shop operation expenditures totaling over $3 million with almost 15,000 repair and preventative maintenance services performed on ag equipment and fleet vehicles. The objective of this project is to evaluate the cost effectiveness of farm shop equipment repairs. Project 2109 is community-based contracts. The Private Facility Contract Monitoring Oversight Division is responsible for monitoring compliance with contractual requirements for community-based privately operated residential re-entry centers, also known as halfway houses, and transitional treatment centers. These contracts are designed to ensure both public safety and the health, safety, and treatment of client residents. Parole supervision clients without an approved residence are placed in a residential reentry center either immediately upon release from prison or upon referral from a parole field staff in the event the client no longer has an approved residence. Clients completing a substance abuse felony punishment facility or in-prison therapeutic community treatment program may be placed in a transitional treatment center for up to 90 days to participate in the initial phase of their treatment programming as a part of their continuum of care. The objective of this project is to evaluate the effectiveness of efforts to monitor community-based residential re-entry and transitional treatment center contracts. Providing and maintaining a safe work and educational environment for offenders throughout their incarceration is a responsibility of both the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and the Wyndham School District. To meet unit-specific and individual offender rehabilitative needs, offenders are provided various jobs and career and technical education programs. As such, each supervisor or teacher has the responsibility to facilitate and document required offender safety training with each department or classroom. The objective of this project is to determine compliance with offender safety training requirements. 2111 is unit schedules. Unit schedules are required to facilitate the management of both security and offender activities throughout all correctional facilities. Examples of scheduled unit activities include offender meals, showers, and necessities exchange, recreation, commissary, education, health care appointments, religious programs, and various offender workforce turnouts to maintain and operate the facility. The development of unit schedules requires the organization, optimization, and prioritization of unit activities within available time frames while ensuring a sufficient number of security staff are available to supervise the offender population. This objective is to evaluate the effectiveness of aligning unit schedules with available security resources. Our next project, 2112, is freight transportation. The Fleet and Freight Transportation Department within the Manufacturing, Agribusiness, and Logistics Division oversees the agency's transportation and distribution requirements. In fiscal year 2019, the department managed a fleet of 171 tractor trucks and 460 tractor trailers. The four dispatch offices coordinated more than 29,000 freight hauls and truck drivers logged approximately 5.8 million miles. This objective is to determine the efficiency of the freight transportation process. Project 2113 is our action plan follow-up and tracking. As you know, we track implementation of audit recommendation action plans on an ongoing basis and determine if or when implementation verification is required. Based on our assessment, we perform audit follow-up and review or testing as needed. The project encompasses our efforts for the review and tracking of those audit recommendations and their implementation status. Project 2114 
is our various walkthroughs. Conducting walkthroughs of functional areas enables the Internal Audit Division to update our risk analysis on a regular basis and ensures attention to those areas of the agency that would not otherwise be reviewed. Unmute yourself, Mr. Cerrito. There you go. Um, so what an excellent, absolutely excellent video presentation that was. Thank you to Media Services for that. Mr. Cerrito, do you have sufficient resources to carry out the plan? Yes, ma'am, we do. Okay, excellent job. Now, Mr. Cerrito, just off the cuff, very impressive the, having the um, auditing division staff members on the video. I really like that. Now, just since you're the director of the uh, auditing division, you probably were totaling this in your head as the, as the video went, went through. How many combined years with the agency do you think our employees have that were just on the video? It, it's a pretty significant number. Just in our management team alone, we have over 100 years of experience. Um, if you total everybody up, we're going to be approaching somewhere between 150 and 200 years of experience within the internal audit division. Very impressive. Yeah, thank you. I knew you'd know. Okay, questions of Mr. Sarita. Uh, this is Mono. I just wanted to make a, a comment. Uh, what, what an impressive presentation. Um, uh, excellent. Uh, you've set the bar pretty high. Um, thank you for that. It was it was extremely informative. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I just want to End second those. I just want to second those comments. This is a, a wonderful format for presenting the upcoming year's list of projects, so that we can really appreciate what you're looking at. And um, I would just encourage you to keep this format in the future. Yes, sir, we absolutely will. And the other thing that I will do is I will make a copy of this video available to each of you so that you can look at it and, uh, you know, follow up and ask any questions that you might have. And we want copies of the red and yellow book, too. Yeah, yes, ma'am. You're more than welcome to them. Over and, the weekend. And, yeah. And Molly, I just like the opportunity. The, I want to say thank you. And we're so happy that we had an opportunity to meet the staff because we don't get to meet everybody. So that was a great idea to be able to see, put a name with the face and what they do and their background. So thank you so much, uh, Chris, for allowing us to be able to, to meet them this way. We we'll appreciate you, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. If there are no other questions during the regular session, I will request that the board approve the proposed fiscal year 21 annual audit plan. Okay. Thank you very much. Hearing nothing else, the meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice Audit and Review Committee is now adjourned. It is 10.02, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And we will not be convening the uh, regular TDCJ meeting until 10.15. The 211th meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice is reconvened in accordance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, the Open Meetings Act. During this meeting, the board will be conducting business from the agenda posted in the Texas Register. Members of the board present for this meeting include Vice Chairman Daryl Lynn Perryman, Secretary Pastor Larry Miles, members Mano de Ayala, Judge Faith Johnson, Judge Molly Francis, Eric Nichols, Ambassador Sitshan Siv, and Dr. Rodney Burrow. A quorum of the board is present and the meeting is now declared open. It is 1046. Uh, the Texas Board of Criminal Justice is committed to providing an opportunity for public presentations on posted agenda topics, as well as public comments on issues within its jurisdiction as provided in Board Rule 151.4. Persons interested in speaking at today's meeting were required to complete and submit the registration form provided in the posting of today's meeting by 5 p.m. on August 12, 2020. For today's meeting, no speaker registration forms were received by board staff prior to the required deadline. 
Therefore, no public presentations will be heard on posted agenda topics today, and no public comments will be heard on issues within its jurisdiction. So let's move on to uh, recognitions. We'll begin our recognitions now. Uh, we have a special recognition today. Our very own executive director is celebrating 35 years of service. At the ripe age of 20, Mr. Brian Collier joined the agency in May of 1985. While going to school at Sam Houston State University and with aspirations of becoming a state trooper, he took a position as a switchboard operator in Huntsville. It didn't take long for officials to notice him. Here he is in 1987, shaking the hand of then executive director, Dr. George Beto. After serving as a correctional officer, Mr. Collier went on to hold a variety of positions, including parole officer, unit supervisor, program administrator, parole division director, deputy executive director, and in 2016, he was named executive director. Just a year later, Mr. Collier helped guide the agency through Hurricane Harvey, and we are certainly grateful that we have him at the helm during this pandemic. I always encourage students to follow their dreams, but Brian, I'm glad that the state trooper thing didn't work out, <laughs> which is yet another example of your favorite Bible verse, James chapter one, verse five, which says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Thank you for your service to the agency and the state of Texas. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll show you my plaque as well, but thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, privilege. Mr. Collier. And we look yes, forward sir. to a long continued relationship with you as executive director. Yes, sir. So let's move on to uh, Mr. Collier. Please proceed with the next recognition of Jerry McGinney. Mr. McGinney, please join us. Double check and make sure Jerry's on. There he is. He on? Okay, good. Uh, thank good you, morning. Chairman O'Daniel. Good morning, and Jerry, thank you for, for taking time to be with us this morning. Today I have a, a, the real privilege of recognizing Jerry McGinney on his departure from the agency. Something normally I wouldn't think is a privilege to recognize, but in this case, it's bittersweet uh, as Jerry left TDCJ for his new role as the director of the Legislative Budget Board. Jerry started with TDCJ in 1989, initially working as a personnel file clerk while attending Sam Houston State University. Following graduation, Jerry worked in the private sector and later came back to TDCJ in 1994. He later served in a wide variety of roles within TDCJ to include purchaser, accountant, budget analyst, budget director, deputy chief financial officer. And in 2008, Jerry was promoted to the position of chief financial officer, where he was responsible for the financial operations of the agency's $3.4 billion budget, as well as overseeing the activities of the business and finance division. I've said it many, many times, but in my opinion, Jerry McGinney was the best CFO in state government. Apparently, Governor Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, and Speaker Bonin think the same, as Jerry is basically now the CFO for the state of Texas. Jerry's a talented leader and absolutely the best person our state leaders could have chosen for his new role as the director of the Legislative Budget Board. It's very difficult for all of us at TDCJ to see Jerry leave. He's been our friend. He's been a fabric of piece of the fabric of TDCJ and a tremendous influence within TDCJ for many years. However, knowing that he left TDCJ to become the director of the Legislative Budget Board gives us some degree of pride. Please join me this morning in congratulating Jerry on his accomplishment. One positive of Jerry moving to Austin and taking the job as the Legislative <coughs> Budget uh, Board Director is we were able to hire his wife Tammy in CJED working in our budget department and that's been a win for TDCJ but we're all very proud of Jerry and just want to wish he and his family the very best in his new role. Well 
Thank you, Mr. Collier, and congratulations, Mr. McGinney. I promise I will not pester you any longer about <laughs> stocking the commissaries. So. <laughs> uh, the board appreciates all you have done, and we wish you the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. All right, Mr. Clark, you have the next recognition. Ms. Malika Tay, Ms. Tay, please join us. Thank you, Chairman, uh, appreciate that. Uh, 2020 certainly has been a year of change, and this is uh, true for Ms. Tay. Uh, not only did she take on a new role in uh, state government following Jerry McGinty to the Legislative Board, but also becoming a new mother. Uh, so congratulations to Malika on both. Uh, Ms. Tay has held a number of jobs within uh, state government. And she was actually the inaugural director of governmental affairs for TDCJ starting in September of 2018. And she had an opportunity to really build our governmental affairs uh, department from the ground up. And uh, she just did a wonderful job. Straight away, she jumped in and helped transition the agency, uh, building a new bill analysis and tracking software really within the first few weeks of her job. And she was in instrumental in our success as we went through the 86th legislative session. Uh, we spent many long nights reviewing uh, uh, legislation and making trips to the Capitol. Uh, and so a lot of fond memories there, but I also know that Ms. Tay's passion is the budget. Uh, so it was bittersweet to learn that uh, she was going uh, with Jerry to the LBB, but it's funny how God puts the right people in the right places. And uh, the state could not have had two better people at the helm uh, during this pandemic, uh, having Ms. Tay and Mr. McGinty there at the LBB. So congratulations, Malika. I know you're gonna do great and thank you for continuing to serve the state of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Clark, I appreciate it. Thank you, Malika. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Clark and congratulations, Ms. Tay. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Collier, I understand you have a few recognitions today. Let's start with our chief financial officer, Ron Steffa. Mr. Steffa, please join us. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this morning, I'd like to recognize Ron Steffa on his promotion to the chief financial officer in April of this year. As we saw Mr. McGinney leave the agency, uh, Jerry had done an outstanding job of preparing folks to step in his shoes and Ron stepped in in April and hasn't missed a beat. Uh, Ron Steffa joined TDCJ in 1992 as an administrative technician in the Human Resources Division. He later promoted to Executive Services and then promoted to the Contracts and Procurement Department. Through that department he was later promoted to the Deputy Director and in 2005 was promoted to the Director of Contracts and Procurement. In 2008 Ron was promoted to the position of Deputy Chief Financial Officer, a position he held until this April. As our Chief Financial Officer, Ron oversees the operations of the agency's $3.4 billion budget, as well as overseeing the Business and Finance Division. Mr. Steffa earned his Master of Business Administration degree from Sam Houston State University in 1993. Ron is an extremely accomplished leader who's highly respected within TDCJ. His strong analytical ability combined with his keen understanding of our agency will serve us well as he assumes this new leadership role. And I'm absolutely serious when I say he hit the, hit the ground running and hasn't missed a beat. So please join me this morning in congratulating Ron on his promotion to Chief Financial Officer. Ron. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Collier, and congratulations on your promotion, Mr. Steffa. I'll be visiting with you shortly about stocking the commissary, so you can look yes, forward to that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Collier, please continue. Yes, sir. The next recognition I have is for Melvin Neely, and I'm not sure if Melvin was able to join with us this morning, but I want to recognize Melvin Neely on his retirement from TDCJ after serving as the Information Technology Division Director since 2017. Prior to joining TDCJ, Melvin served 20 years in the U.S. Army as a non-commissioned officer in a wide variety of leadership roles related to infantry and combat arms. Melvin began his career with TDCJ in 2001 after retiring from the military as a program administrator promoting through the ranks of the Information Technology Division, where he held a variety of management positions until being promoted to Deputy Division Director for Information Technology in 2010. 
Melvin retired from TDCJ in 2017, but was swayed back from retirement later in 2017 to serve as our Director of Information Technology Division. His operational oversight and experience combined with his creativity and proven leadership served this agency well. Uh, please join me in congratulating Mr. Neely on his well-deserved retirement. We wish Melvin and his family absolutely all the best. Thank you, Mr. Collier, and congratulations on your retirement, Mr. Neely. Mr. Steffa, I understand you have the next recognition, Ms. Jennifer Gonzalez. Mr. Steffa and Ms. Gonzalez, please join us. Thank you, and it is my pleasure to recognize Jennifer Gonzalez. Uh, Jennifer has over 18 years of experience with the Department of Criminal Justice. Uh, she began her career in 2001 as a purchaser in contracts and procurement, and she's soon promoted to budget analyst. And within the budget department, she's also served as senior analyst and deputy budget director. Jennifer was then promoted to the director of accounting and business services, where she held that position until her recent uh, selection as deputy chief financial officer. Uh, Jennifer holds a master of business administration from Sam Houston State University and her strong and focused leadership and her vast knowledge of agency and fiscal operations will serve her well in this new position. So please join me in congratulating her in this new role. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stefa, and congratulations on your promotion, Ms. Gonzalez. Congratulations. Mr. Collier, I understand you have the next recognition, Frank Inman. Mr. Inman, yes, sir. please join us. It was good to see Frank, but you can see Frank has changed. Uh, <laughs> after, <laughs> uh, but very good to see Frank this morning, but I'd like to recognize Frank Inman on his retirement, which happened earlier this year in March. Uh, Frank began working for TDCJ in July of 1997. Uh, Frank was our facilities director when he retired from TDCJ. When he started working in 1997 for TDCJ, he became the agency's first assistant director for contracts and procurement. And upon his arrival at TDCJ, he implemented and managed a centralized contract branch, which encompassed all of our agency contracts, including facility renovation contracts. He created and put in place consistent contracting processes and controls that are still utilized today and have helped TDCJ stay as one of the most recognized agencies in state government as it relates to contracting and doing contracting correctly. Uh, Frank is the one that we brought in to set all that up in the 90s and did a fantastic job. He was subsequently promoted to the Director of Contracts and Procurement, and in 2005, he was promoted to the Division Director for the Facilities Division, a position that he held until his retirement in March. In addition to Frank's state service, he had served 20 years with the U.S. Air Force and retired at the rank of Senior Master Sergeant, and also worked for the Internal Revenue Service before his time with TDCJ. Frank provided exceptional leadership to the agency during his tenure, and his service assisted the agency in enhancing our ability to meet our mission. Uh, Frank was one who helped get it done, and then you know in the facilities division, there's always not enough money, been way too many projects, and Frank was able to make it always stretch to where it needed to go. But please join me this morning in congratulating Frank uh, on his very well-deserved retirement, and wish him well. Thank you, Mr. Collier, and congratulations on your retirement, Mr. Inman. Thank very you. much appreciate all your hard work. Uh, we wish you the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Collier. But I would like to add that being in a division director position in facilities for 15 years, you didn't realize this until after I retired that, man, lasting 15 years, I had to be doing something right. So... <laughs> And I realized it's really the support groups that gets all the division directors through. And I would just like to thank those support groups. One being this board that supported me through my tenure. Also the board under Chairman Crane, the board under Chairman Bell, the board under Chairman Wainwright. They all supported me. And of course, certainly I would like to recognize the leaders of this agency who were my mentors Mr. Livingston and Mr. Collier. So I appreciate having great leaders to work under in, the, in, this, in this agency and for the state of Texas. But also I'd like to recognize the employees in the trenches that do the work. They are the ones that help us be successful. And of course, last but not least is my family. You know, you have to have support groups when you're a child 
all the way up into adulthood. You need, a, you need support groups during your career as well. And my family has been there to support me. So thank you for your kind words. And I appreciate your words. And now you get to enjoy your family. So full time. So congratulations again on that, Mr. Inman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collier, please continue with the next recognition. Mr. Cody Ginzel, Mr. Ginzel, please join us. Thank you, Chairman. And I, I'm sure that Frank was enjoying watching Cody present today on the uh, facilities report to the board, but I want to recognize Cody Ginzel on his promotion to the facilities division director in March of this year. Uh, Cody began his career in 1988 uh, working for the Wyndham School District and then in 1990 became a correctional officer within TDCJ. He promoted through the security ranks to senior warden, regional director, director of correctional training, and deputy director of management operations within the correctional institutions division. In 2016, Cody was promoted to the division director for the private facility contract monitoring and oversight division. In March of this year, Cody was promoted to the director of the facilities division. Now, since assuming his role as the director of the facilities division, he spent a considerable amount of time in the command center assisting the agency as we navigate COVID-19. But even with that distraction, Cody has quickly proven, quickly proven to be a great pick for the facilities division if they have met many challenges head on and made substantial progress on a variety of projects over the past few months. Mr. Gensel is an excellent leader and we're very fortunate to have someone of his ability in such a position. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Gensel on his selection as the Facilities Division Director for TDCJ. Thank you, thank you Mr. Collier, and congratulations on your promotion, Mr. Gensel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Clark, could you join us for the next recognition? Ms. Kathleen Blifford. Ms. Blifford, please join us too. Chairman, thank you. Uh, with the transitioning of Malika Tay to the LBB, the agency had a vacancy to fill in the governmental affairs director position. Uh, but TDCJ has been so fortunate to have such high caliber uh, individuals that are interested in coming to TDCJ. And this is certainly true of our next recognition. Uh, Kate Blifford uh, joined TDCJ exactly, I think, one month and one day ago. And you can see her there on the screen. Uh, prior to taking this uh, role, she was the Deputy Budget and Policy Director for the Office of the Governor Budget and Policy Division. Kate has more than 17 years of experience in state government to include serving as Assistant Press Secretary for former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Tom Craddock. She transitioned into a policy analyst role before being named Assistant Parliamentarian. And then in 2009, Kate became uh, Representative Craddock's Chief of Staff until leaving to join the Governor's team. Uh, Kate is a true Texan. She's a Longhorn. Uh, we'll hold that against her, but she absolutely uh, believes in service to the state of Texas, and she has already hit the ground running and doing a fantastic job. So, Kate, uh, welcome yeah. to TBCJ team, and uh, we look forward to the great things that you're going to do. I look forward to being here. I'm so excited to join the team. And Mr. Clark, I'd point out I'm a Longhorn too, so keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Clark, and congratulations, Ms. Blifford. Welcome Thank you, to Chairman. TDCJ. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collier, please continue with the next several recognitions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd next like to recognize Pam Telke, our former TDCJ Parole Division, on her retirement in June of this year. Ms. Telke began her career in 1989 as a parole caseworker in Houston. Ms. Telke promoted through the ranks serving in a variety of parole management positions to include unit supervisor, parole supervisor, assistant regional director, director of specialized programs, deputy division director, and in 2016 was promoted as the parole division director. During her time as the parole division director, Pam worked diligently to improve the operations of the division and help make many enhancements to our supervision strategies as well as our offender programming. Pam is a confident and accomplished leader who provided exceptional leadership to TDCJ during her tenure. Her commitment and dedication to the agency will have a lasting impact for years to come. Uh, please join me this morning as we recognize Pam on her well-deserved retirement from TDCJ. Thank you, Mr. Collier, and congratulations on your retirement, Ms. Thunke. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's been an honor and a privilege and um, great opportunities. And I really echo a lot of what Mr. Inman said. It's, it's, uh, it's time to, to move on to something different, but I also appreciate 31 years of an amazing experience. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Oh, if you could just continue with yes, sir, uh, I will. Ms. Uh, yeah. Renee Hinojosa. Yes, sir. And as I, as I continue, uh, I would like to recognize Renee Hinojosa um, on his promotion to the parole division director for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice uh, in June of this year. As Renee came in after Ms. Telke retired, Renee has been selected to fill her shoes. Renee began his career with TDCJ in 1994 as an institutional parole officer at the Lockhart Unit. Since that time, Mr. Hinojosa has served in various positions and divisions to include district parole officer, parole analyst, contract monitor, regional supervisor, deputy division director of the administrative review and risk management division. And in November of 2017, Renee was named director of the rehabilitation programs division. Earlier this year, uh, you may be aware, but I asked Renee to serve as the lead for developing and implementing our strike teams that have conducted mass COVID testing within the system. And Renee took that charge on uh, within an hour of asking Renee to step in. He was in the command center and within a day had him up and running and was continuing to manage that process throughout until June uh, when he moved to the parole division as the new parole director. Renee was promoted again to the director for the parole division. He is an experienced and proven leader who is both operationally capable, but also operationally creative. Uh, he will really serve this agency well in this new role. Uh, please join me this morning as we congratulate Renee on his selection as the Parole Division Director for TDCJ. Congratulations, Renee. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Collier, and congratulations on your promotion, Mr. Hinojosa. And I'd just like to say that hopefully at some future board meeting, I will be able to honor the strike forces properly because you have done a fabulous job. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Collier, we can yes, move sir. on to Allison Dunbar. Yes, sir. I would next like to recognize Allison Dunbar. And as I do the departing and receiving, if you think, if you think of it that way, as you saw Mr. Gensel move to private facilities, Ms. Dunbar has replaced Mr. Gensel in the, or Cody moved to facilities. Allison is replacing Cody in the division, the director of the private facility contract monitoring and oversight division. And we'll recognize her this morning. Allison began her career with TDCJ in 1993, working as a time clerk in the classification and records office. She later promoted to an accounting clerk and an accountant in the cashier's office. Also worked in internal audit as an internal auditor, later as a budget analyst and the assistant budget director in the budget department for TDCJ. In 2011, Allison was promoted to the private facility contract monitoring oversight division as the deputy director of compliance monitoring and in 2016 was promoted to the deputy division director for that division where she was responsible for the daily operations and oversight of the compliance and monitoring staff. Earlier this month, Allison was promoted to the division director for the private facility contract monitoring and oversight division. Allison brings a strong operational background and a strong financial background to the position, both of which will serve the agency well as she assumes this new position. Please join me this morning as we congratulate Allison on her promotion as she assumes this leadership role within TDCJ. Congratulations, Allison. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Collier. Congratulations on your promotion, Ms. Dunbar. Look forward to working with you. Uh, next, Mr. Collier is yes, uh, Christopher Carter. Chris Carter. Yes, sir. This morning, Chairman, I'd like to recognize Chris Carter, or Christopher Carter, on his promotion to the Director of the Rehabilitation Programs Division for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, replacing Renee Hinojosa as he moved to the Parole Division. Mr. Carter began his career in 1995 as a correctional officer at the Garza East Unit. He promoted through the correctional ranks all the way to senior warden, a position he held at multiple TDCJ facilities to include the Styles and the Estelle units. In 2017, Mr. Carter was promoted to the deputy division director for the administrative review and risk management division. And in 2019 was named deputy division director for the rehabilitation programs division. 
He served in this role until July when he was promoted to division director for the Rehabilitation Programs Division. Chris has a commitment to successful treatment and programming, which combined with his proven leadership abilities will serve our agency well in this new capacity. Please join me this morning as we congratulate Chris on his promotion to Director of Rehabilitation Programs for TDCJ. Congratulations, Chris. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Collier. Congratulations on your promotion, Mr. Uh, Carter. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Carter, I understand you have the next recognition, Mr. Michael Rutledge. Mr. Rutledge, please join us. Thank you, Chairman. I have the honor to present Michael Rutledge. Michael Rutledge began his career with TDCJ 2008, where he worked for the Parole Division. He later joined the Rehabilitation Programs Division, where he served the agency as the Deputy of Chaplaincy Programs. In uh, 2018, Michael Rutledge was promoted to the uh, Manager 4 position, which he served the agency covering the post-secondary education and the operations sections of the uh, Rehabilitation Programs Division. Effective August the 1st, Michael Rutledge was promoted to the Deputy Division Director of the Rehabilitation Programs Division. And I'd like to have you join and thank and congratulate Mr. Rutledge for the promotion. Thank you, Mr. Carter, and congratulations on your promotion. Well deserved, Mr. Rutledge. Thank you. Uh, and I, I think that's it on uh, those uh, recognitions. The Texas Board of Criminal Justice recognizes TDCJ employees who have dedicated 25, 30, 35, and 40 years of service to the state of Texas. These individuals represent the strong commitment of this agency's staff system-wide. I, along with my fellow board members and executive director, Brian Collier, express our deepest gratitude for their continued service. During the months of July and August 2020, 259 employees attained 83 years of service, 31 employees attained 30 years of service, 22 employees attained 35 years of service, three employees attained 40 years of service and one employee attained 45 years of service. Today, I would like to individually recognize the employees that have attained 40 and 45 years of service for their dedication. The first uh, employee that I would like to honor is uh, Robert Herrera. He began his career as a correctional officer in 1980 and promoted through the ranks by serving the agency in the capacities of Sergeant, Lieutenant, Captain, and Major. In December 1994, he was promoted to the position of Assistant Warden at the Mark W. Michael Unit. September 2001, he was named as the Assistant Warden at the Beto One Unit. He was promoted to the rank of Warden One at the Wallace Pack Unit in Navasota on July 1st, 2010, where he is currently serving as the Senior Warden. In 2018, he was selected as Warden of the Year by the North American Association of Wardens and Superintendents. Warden Herrera is an asset to our agency who embodies our core values, perseverance, integrity, courage, and commitment. Thank you, Mr. Herrera. Next is Jerry Carricker Jr., who has served the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for over 40 years. After attending Sam Houston State University, Mr. Carricker was working as a blacksmith assistant when he received his call for employment from the TDCJ. He began his career on June 16, 1980 at the Ramsey Farm Shop as a correctional officer and later promoted into Ramsey's row crops operation. Mr. Carricker assisted the row crops operation until he promoted to the assistant farm shop supervisor and later became the farm shop supervisor at the PAC unit. On September 1st, 1991, 
Mr. Carricker was promoted to the assistant farm manager of agriculture at the Cofield and Beto units. In 2000, Mr. Carricker was promoted to the farm manager of the Cofield Beto agricultural department, which included overseeing the field crops, beef cattle, swine, edible crops, gardens, farm shop, and feed mill operations until he retired in March of 2009. In June of 2009, Mr. Carricker was rehired as an agriculture specialist for to supervise the edible crops program at the Cofield unit, where his focus remains on producing quality fresh produce for the Tennessee Colony area units. Thank you for your service. Next is Robert B. Sitka. He began his career with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice on September 14, 1980, as a correctional officer at the C.T. Terrell unit, and is proud to say he has held numerous positions at the unit to include being a member of the perimeter security team during the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. His marksmanship is a skill he has developed and perfected over the span of his career. Mr. Sitka is a valued and treasured part of the Terrell unit family. He is full of knowledge and readily shares with those around him. Although Mr. Sitka has put in 40 years of service, he has no plans of retiring or slowing down and looks forward to many years of service in the future. And I look forward to uh, having you serve with us for many years in the service. Thank you. Lastly, I would like to recognize Melissa Hodgson. Miss Hodgson began her career with the state of Texas in 1975 with the Texas Department of Public Safety. Melissa quickly promoted to other positions throughout her time with the Department of Public Safety until she retired as a research specialist in July of 2008. After only a short time away from public service, Melissa continued her career with the Office of the Inspector General as a research specialist for the newly formed Information Systems Division of OIG. Melissa began on the ground floor of the new division, which has become a very important part of OIG. Her work as a research specialist was and is a vital part of assisting investigators in the criminal analysis of their cases. With her hard work and dedication, Melissa became the supervisor of the criminal analyst section of ISD on November 10th, 2010. Melissa continues to lead her team in analysis of cell phones and research of criminal investigations, including gang initiatives, blue warrant roundups, and violent fugitives. The Inspector General would like to congratulate Melissa on 45 years of service to the great state of Texas. Thank you all for your perseverance, integrity, courage, and commitment to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. I would like to add that the names of these employees will be submitted for inclusion in the official minutes of this board meeting. The Texas Board of Criminal Justice congratulates each of these employees and thanks you for your unwavering loyalty and dedication to the citizens of Texas. As a symbol of our appreciation, each of you will receive a board certificate along with a personal letter of gratitude. Thank you very much. The next agenda topic covers consent items. Are there any amendments, objections, or abstentions to the proposed consent items. Hearing none, the consent items posted for the meeting's agenda will stand approved. The next item on the agenda will be a report from the TDCJ Executive Director, Mr. Collier, if you'd like to proceed. Thank you, Chairman. I want to update, update you today on uh, COVID-19, what's going on within the agency. At the time of our June board meeting, we obviously were feeling the full effects of COVID-19 within TDCJ. Since June, we have continued to feel that full effect of COVID-19 as we focus 
all of our efforts on prevention, mitigation, and how we address COVID-19 to the best of our ability. Over the past two months, we've seen an average of nearly 200 positive cases per day within our system. However, as we identify many of those cases through our mass testing, we see that over 75% of our positive cases are asymptomatic. We have performed more COVID testing than any correctional system in the United States, doing over 225,000 tests, 225, tests within TDCJ. And it's testing that has allowed us to take some steps at returning to normal operations where we can. Since I spoke to you in June, we've begun the intake of offenders from county jails and have brought over 2,500 offenders into the system who were waiting to come into TDCJ. Prior to allowing the intake of any offender into TDCJ, we work closely with county officials to screen each offender and help make sure we do not bring an offender into the system who is COVID positive or who has been exposed to COVID recently. Additionally, all new received offenders are placed in quarantine for a minimum of 14 days upon arrival. There are currently about 6,000 offenders within county jails that are waiting on intake into TDCJ, and we are continuing to work closely with county officials to bring those offenders into the system as safely as possible. We have also placed more than 3,000 offenders into programming based on parole approvals by the Board of Pardons and Paroles to allow these offenders to meet their program requirements for release and begin their treatment programs. In late June, we established compliance assessment teams to visit TDCJ units and offices to help review our compliance with the protective pr protocols related to COVID-19. These teams have visited 158 TDCJ locations, working closely with wardens, regional directors, division directors, office managers, and staff to help ensure we're all taking the proper COVID precautions. All areas to include employee screening, disinfecting, wearing of the correct type of mask and other protective equipment are reviewed to validate that we're taking the correct measures. These teams will continue to audit TDCJ locations on a 60-day rotation for the foreseeable future. We're also in the process of modifying our mass testing protocols to try to provide more focus on our employees as well as our units that house our most vulnerable offenders. To help return some things to normal within our prisons, we've been working uh, diligently on trying to bring video visitation to our units and we'll have some video visitation capability on a small number of units later this month to allow visitation to begin. Our plan is to put in place temporary measures to offer widespread video visitation to our offenders until a more long-term solution can be deployed. Additionally, our Manufacturing Agribusiness and Logistics Division has been manufacturing insulated tray lids that can be used in combination with our food trays to allow hot meals to be delivered to offenders in their housing areas for those that are on medical restriction or on precautionary lockdown. As of this week, over 14,000 insulated tray lids have been manufactured and distributed. Sadly, COVID-19 has continued to attack our staff and the offenders since our last board meeting. COVID-19 has taken the lives of 10 of our staff. Kenneth Harbin, correctional officer at the Daniel Unit, Jerry Esparza, a correctional officer at the Jester 3 Unit, Jackson Pongay, a correctional officer at the Lynchner Unit, Sandra Rivera, an inventory specialist at the Torres unit, Ruben Martinez, a correctional officer at the Lopez unit, Eric Johnson, a correctional officer at the Bird unit, Richard Holly, sergeant at the Goodman unit, Charles Chacon, an industrial specialist at the McConnell unit, Labalth Bow, a correctional officer at the Cofield unit, and last night, Waltero Rodriguez, a chaplain at the Segovia unit. We have lost a total of 18 employees thus far due to this pandemic. Each of these employees has lost their battle with COVID-19. However, they will never be forgotten for their bravery and their commitment to public safety and for the ultimate sacrifice that they paid. We pray for their families and coworkers who still mourn each of these losses and will honor them later this year in our fallen officer service. We also pray for the families and loved ones of our offenders who have passed away during COVID-19 and we, and pray again for their families and loved ones throughout this pandemic. I would like to publicly commend the employees of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, the thousands of men and women who make up this agency, who have continued to be heroes throughout this event. Their daily sacrifice to this state allows our agency to meet our mission of delivering public safety, and that doesn't go unnoticed. They have all been true heroes. 
Chairman, I'd also like to thank you and each of the members of the board for taking time during the past few days to allow Mr. Steffa, Ms. Gonzalez, and Ms. Waltz to present our 2021 operational budget to you. I would like to commend Ron Steffa and our finance team for their hard work in preparing the budget. As we discussed in our briefings, we've yet to receive instructions for our legislative appropriations request, and upon receipt of those instructions, we'll work to prepare the request and coordinate with each of you to provide a briefing on the legislative appropriation request. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Collier. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, the uh, next item on the agenda is the chairman's report. Good morning. Unfortunately, just as was the case with my June chairman's report, my remarks this morning will focus on those lost to COVID-19 since our last board meeting. The entire world continues to battle COVID-19. This is certainly true here in the Lone Star State and within the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. It has presented a challenge like none other. Yet each day, the men and women of this agency and others muster the strength to continue on. They don their uniforms, enter correctional facilities, go into our communities and staff administrative offices day in, day out, determined to make a difference. I am incredibly proud of the bravery they display each and every day, week in, week out, month in, month out. This morning, we will honor those who are no longer able to carry on the good fight as mentioned by Mr. Collier. As I reflected on their lives, I was reminded that God did not promise us an easy life. He did not grant us happiness. Instead, he said we will have suffering and heartache, but he also promised us that we, he will be with us to comfort us and one day reunite us. Pastor Miles, I am thankful for that promise. And in the words of Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Though these individuals may be gone, they are not forgotten because their memories live on. Please allow me a few minutes to tell you about each of them. Robert Armstrong, Texas Tech, a dedicated and committed professional at his job, Robert Armstrong was the epitome of someone who went beyond service in their skills and duties as a nurse practitioner at the Sanchez State Jail in El Paso. Bob, as he was known to his co-workers at the Texas Tech University Health Science Center, Center was a hero in every sense of the word. They say he was intelligent, articulate, and skilled while fulfilling his daily tasks. Bob was the director of nursing and facility health administrator for the Sanchez State Jail from 1998 to 2002, and was then a nurse practitioner there from 2013 until his death. Robert Armstrong, age 56, died from the coronavirus on June 16th, 2020. Joe Lang, Board of Pardons and Paroles, a 25 year veteran of the Board of Pardons and Paroles. There really wasn't a job that Joe Lang could not do. Joe began working as a clerk in 1994 and then meticulously worked his way up to clerical supervisor, program administrator, parole officer five, clemency director, and staff development manager. Dedicated and committed, along with a friendly team player, were how his colleagues at the board described Joe. He was admired and respected by his co-workers, not only in Austin, but statewide. 
His contributions to the Board of Pardons and Paroles have been immense and he will be greatly missed. Joe Lang, age 56, died from the coronavirus on July 1st, 2020. Dr. Gary Wright, UTMB. Dr. Gary Wright dedicated his life to his patients, his family, and his friends. Since 2009, he has been a stellar physician within the Palestine area of cluster units. He had a passion for life, which fueled his purpose and commitment to provide exemplary medical care to his patients. Dr. Wright was a friend to many and a loving family man. He enjoyed spending time with his friends and family at his second home on Catalina Island. If you were blessed enough to know him, you respected and admired him for his knowledge, his candor, his quick wit, and most of all, for his generous and loving heart. He will be greatly missed. Dr. Wright died from the coronavirus on July 1st, 2020. Kenneth Harbin, CO Daniel Unit. A 30-year veteran of the agency, correctional officer Kenneth Harbin is described by his peers as a selfless person who gave it his all, whether he was on the job or away with his family and friends. Kenneth found a way to uplift anyone who was around him, whether it was with a joke or just a simple pat on the back to keep you going on a tough day. Many of his co-workers at the Daniel Unit in Snyder have said he was a great correctional officer, but also he was an even better friend. He especially enjoyed training new officers who were assigned to visitation. When not at work, he surrounded himself with his family, especially his beloved children and grandchildren. Kenneth began his TDCJ career in September 1989 and retired in February 2012, but he could not stay away and was rehired in November 2012. Kenneth was diagnosed with the coronavirus on June 28th and was being treated at a Lubbock area hospital where he was showing signs of improvement, but he took an unexpected turn for the worse. Officer Kenneth Harbin age 60, died from the coronavirus on July 4th, 2020. Jerry Esperanza, CO Jester 3 unit, known as the backbone of the third shift at the Jester 3 unit, Jerry Esperanza could light up a room with his presence. A dedicated family man, Jerry was also committed to his work with more than 25 years of service to the agency. Darrington Unit Senior, Senior Warden L.E. Townsend described Jerry as, quote, an amazing father and husband whose absence will leave a void that nobody can replace. Jerry began his TDCJ career at the McConnell Unit in May 1995. In March 1996, he transferred to Hospital Galveston, and in September 1997, he moved on to the Jester 3 unit, where he provided guidance and leadership to all who would listen to him. He never turned down assistance to anyone. He was a lifelong Dallas Cowboys fan and supported them through the good times and the bad times. I'm with you there, Jerry. On June 17th, Jerry began treatment at Memorial Hermann Hospital in Sugarland after testing positive for COVID-19. Officer Jerry Esperanza, age 45, died from the coronavirus on July 15th, 2020. Jackson Pongay, Lynchner State Jail. Correctional Officer Jackson Pongay 
came to the United States from Liberia, West Africa, to pursue a better life for himself and his family. When he arrived, he saw an advertisement to work for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. He applied, was accepted, and began his first assignment at the Atascacita State Jail, which later became the Pam Lynchner State Jail. Shift supervisors at the jail knew that uh, he could be depended upon to complete every task he was assigned, regardless of its difficulty. Jackson gave every assignment his best effort. His colleagues have stated that he was always there for everyone. If anyone was having a problem, Jackson was there to help. But most of all, Jackson was part of the TDCJ family. He befriended almost everyone he met and loved to show off his cooking skills for them, especially with cuisine from his native country of Liberia. His other hobby was buying, refurbishing, and selling cars from local auction centers. Officer Pongay leaves behind a wife of 11 years, Kate, who is a nurse at Houston Methodist Hospital and three children. Correctional Officer Jackson Pongay, age 56, died from the coronavirus on July 15th, 2020. Sandra Rivera, Inventory Specialist, Torres Unit. Ms. Sandra Rivera always came to work at the Torres Unit with a smile on her face and enthusiasm for her duties in the commissary. A tremendous asset to the Torres unit in Hondo and its commissary department, Ms. Rivera's energy and vitality will be missed by all who work closely with her. When Sandra came into the room, it was like turning on a light. She absolutely had a positive effect on everyone around her. Ms. Rivera truly had a servant's heart and was fond of Romans 8:28. Quote, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. She will truly be missed. Miss Rivera worked for the agency for more than seven years. Her last day at the unit was July 6th when she fell ill. She tested positive for the coronavirus a few days later. Sandra Rivera, age 50, died from the coronavirus on July 21st, 2020. Ruben Martinez, CO Lopez State Jail. Only two years on the job, Correctional Officer Ruben Martinez had already established himself as an employee who exhibited unwavering service at the Lopez State Jail in Edinburgh. Officer Martinez was a family man, and according to Senior Warden Juan Garcia, quote, he was a man of faith. Ruben not only believed in himself, but was one that would place Jesus first as he faced new challenges. He always had a positive attitude and was willing to lend a hand at any time to a fellow coworker, end quote, whether it was on the job or away from jail. Officer Martinez tested positive for the coronavirus on July 13th and was admitted to the hospital several days later when he began having complications from the virus. Officer Ruben Martinez, age 48, died from the coronavirus on July 26th, 2020. Eric Johnson, Bird Unit, Correctional Officer Eric Johnson was known throughout the Bird Unit for his constant smile, positive words of encouragement, and a larger than life personality. Eric began working for the agency at the Ferguson Unit in June 2002, following in his family's footsteps. His wife, his father, his stepmother, his uncle, and his sister-in-law are all employees of TDCJ. In March 2011, he transferred to the Bird Unit in Huntsville. Respected by almost everyone he came in contact with, Eric was a dedicated Dallas Cowboys fan, me too, 
and was willing to argue with anyone who disagreed with him about this tea. Eric leaves behind his wife, Charity, and his four children. Officer Eric Johnson, age 37, died from the coronavirus on July 27th, 2020. Sergeant Richard Holly, Goodman Unit, described as a well-liked and respected employee who loved his community, Sergeant Richard Holly of the Goodman Unit had 24 years of service with the agency. Warden Bradley Hutchison at the Goodman Unit says, Richard brought the, his experience and wisdom to the job every day. Quote, he was a great mentor to our staff and a great friend as well, said Warden Hutchison. Always ready with an encouraging word, Richard would help get the job done no matter what it took. Outside of his dedication to the staff at the Goodman Unit, Richard is most remembered for playing Santa Claus in the annual Jasper Christmas Parade and decorating his house with lights that dance to Christmas music. I can kind of see uh, Santa Claus in him. He never met a stranger and made everyone feel welcome no matter where he met them. Sergeant Richard Holly, age 62, died from the coronavirus on August 4th, 2020. Charles Chicone, McConnell unit. Charles Chicone Jr. began his career with the agency 23 years ago as the laundry manager at the Garza West unit in Beeville. During this time, he also worked for facilities maintenance at the Garza units and the McConnell unit. Seven years ago, he became an industrial specialist at the McConnell Garment Factory. Charles has been described as a, quote, feisty, dependable, friendly, and hardworking employee who made it a point to always greet anyone who visited the McConnell Garment Factory. His sense of duty and hard work was instilled in him from his service to our country in Vietnam and as a 20-year veteran of the United States Navy. He retired from the Navy and continued serving our country as a civil service employee before joining TDCJ. When he was away from the McConnell unit, Charles enjoyed spending time with his family, which includes his wife, Adelpha, his daughter, Becky, his son, Charlie, and his five grandchildren. Charles Chicon, age 77, died from the coronavirus on August 11th, 2020. Leboth Boa, Cofield Unit. Correctional Officer Leboth Boa was well known among his fellow employees at the Cofield Unit. He had an easygoing manner and a big heart that matched his smile. Leboth began his employment with the agency in August 2016 at the Cofield Unit. He made it a point to speak to everyone on his shift and would always ask how their day was going. His positive attitude about work and life was contagious and genuine. He tested positive for COVID-19 on July 18th and was admitted to a hospital in Arlington on July 29th. Officer Leboeth Boa, age 61, died from the coronavirus on August 12th, 2020. Chaplain Walterio Rodriguez. Chaplain Walterio Rodriguez loved the Lord. This was evident to all those that knew him, including staff and offenders alike at the Segovia unit in Edinburgh. Chaplain Rodriguez began his career with TDCJ in 2009 as a chaplain. Before that, he had a career as a lineman for a local electric company. When he wasn't ministering at the facility, he was active in his local church serving as the director of children's church and youth groups. Segovia unit warden Juan Garcia had this to say about Chaplain Rodriguez, quote, he was such a great person, man of faith, man of believing, and a man who would bend over backwards to help someone in need. 
I will never forget all the times he prayed over me and my unit during those hard times. I have lost a wonderful friend and not just a chaplain. Chaplain Walterio Rodriguez, age 67, died from the coronavirus on August 13th, 2020. Finally, I think it is very important to take a moment to remember those others who have died who are, who are associated with TDCJ. For truly, the pain of loss and suffering is not exclusive to TDCJ employees. Individuals incarcerated within TDCJ and on supervision within our communities have also succumbed to this virus. Indeed, it has been particularly hard on those incarcerated as visitation has had to be suspended due to the infectious nature of the virus. We grieve for them as well. They leave behind spouses and children, parents and friends. Their lives matter. In the words of Hebrews 13.3, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. Finally, I quote Psalm 34, 18, which says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. I would like to take a moment of silence and simply ask that you lift up those that are brokenhearted, that they may find comfort during this dark time. Thank you. We are all in the midst of the same storm. I cannot tell you how far until we're on the other side. Mr. Collier and his team will continue to adjust their sails as seas change. I am confident with patience, perseverance, and above all prayer that we will get through this together. Thank you. The next item on the agenda will be a report from Judge Rebecca Palomo member of the Judicial Advisory Council. Judge Palomo, thank you for joining us today. If you are ready, please proceed. I am ready. Good morning, members and honorable chair. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to make this brief introductory presentation on behalf of the Judicial Advisory Council, also known as the JAC. Who are we? The JAC was statutorily created 31 years ago in 1989 under legislation that created the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. The JAC is composed of 12 people, six of whom are appointed by the Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court. The other six are appointed by the presiding judge of the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. The JAC brings to the table various stakeholders with diverse and relevant backgrounds across the criminal justice system, including district court judges, a director of a criminal of a community supervision and corrections department, better known as adult probation department, prosecutors and defense attorneys, and members of the public. Each member serves a six year term. As a JAC member, this is my first time participating in this board's meeting. I congratulate you for publicly and individually recognizing today many people that have invested their professional years to criminal justice. I'm honored to have worked within criminal justice in different capacities for, for over 20 years now. Texas Supreme Court Chief Justice Nathan Hecht appointed me to the JAC in 2014, in large part, I'm told, because I am the only state district court judge in Texas who has served as a former state prosecutor and as a former director of an adult probation department here in Texas. My fellow members on the JAC likewise come from diverse professional backgrounds and have done extensive and impressive, impressive work within the criminal justice field. What does the JAC do? We meet quarterly 
generally follow, following the probation advisory council meetings. The probation advisory council is also known as the PAC. The PAC meeting brings together all the adult probation directors from across the state of Texas. The JAC is responsible for advising the Board of Criminal Justice and the director of CJAD on matters of interest in the judiciary, particularly those matters affecting the administration of community supervision and corrections departments. As you know, CJAD, previously the Adult Probation Commission, oversees local probation departments by setting minimum standards for their programs, facilities, and services, as well as certifying and funding their work. CJAD staff provides a wealth of information, statistics, and reports that provide the JAC insight to the effectiveness of programs to meet our shared goals to reduce recidivism while protecting the general public. Our current focus, at this time, the JAC is preparing for the next legislative session and its impact on probation and the trial courts. We will provide resource information to the legislature and to the various stakeholders within the criminal justice system, the judiciary, prosecutors, defense attorneys, CJAD, and this board. We look forward to working in collaboration with this board as we navigate through the COVID environment and prepare ourselves for the next legislative session. I'll close with a note of gratitude for the leadership of Jack's chair, Judge Rose Reyna. As chair, Judge Reyna has steered the council through challenging times, and I thank her for the opportunity to visit with you today. If there are any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me at any time at the 341st District Court in Laredo, Webb County, Texas. My direct number is 956 523-4325, and my email is rpalomo at webcountytx.gov. I am happy to entertain any questions you may have for me this morning. Thank you very much, Judge, for that very informative presentation. I was whispering to my board manager to get me a copy of your remarks. So I don't, I hope you don't mind, we'll reach out for that. I found that very uh, informative to learn more about what you do. So thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you for having us here, thank you. All right, are, are there any other questions from the board? No, just uh, thank you, Judge Palomo, for that very informative uh, presentation and the work that you and the rest of the committee continue to do in service of the state. Thank you. It's an, it's an honor to serve you. Thank you, Judge. All right, the next item on the agenda is the discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding the selection of the Prison Rape Elimination Act PREA Ombudsman. The PREA Ombudsman serves as an independent office to review or conduct administrative investigations of allegations of sexual abuse and sexual harassment, as well as provide a point of contact for elected officials, the public and offenders to report allegations of sexual abuse and sexual harassment or inquiries related to PREA. PREA Ombudsman Lynn Sharp notified the board of her plans to retire effective July 31st, 2020. The position was posted on June 29th for 10 days in the PREA search committee composed of Vice Chairman Darylin Perryman, Secretary Pastor Larry Miles, Judge Molly Francis, and Judge Faith Johnson selected qualified candidates to interview. The search committee interviewed the candidates in late July and earlier today, the committee presented their recommendations to the full board for discussion in executive session. Vice Chairman Darylin Perriman emphasized that the selection of the new pre-ombudsman would not occur until the regular session of today's meeting. Are there any questions from the board? If, uh, if uh, not, then I would uh, entertain a motion. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the selection of Cassandra McGilbra as the PREA Ombudsman to be effective August 15, 2020. I have a motion. Is there a second? A second. second. Oh, you got two seconds. <laughs> I have two seconds and then what happens? All right. Um, 
Uh, uh, we have a motion. It's been seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you again very much for the committee for uh, putting together all your hard work during these difficult times when you could not meet in person. So thank you very much. The next agenda, uh, the next item on the agenda is the discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding the proposed fiscal year 2021 annual audit plan. Chris Cerrito, if you're ready to begin, please proceed. Yes, sir. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman and members. At this time, I would like to request that the board approve the annual audit plan for fiscal year 21 as presented in the audit committee and grant me the authority to modify the plan if necessary, so long as I follow the instructions carried out, the, the instructions listed in board policy 1402. Thank you, Mr. Cerrito, for the comprehensive report that you did earlier in the committee. As you heard from several board members, that was an outstanding report. We look forward to seeing that in the future. Are there any questions or comments from the board? If not, thank you. Do I have a motion? Yes, I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the internal audit plan for fiscal year 2021 and authorize the internal audit director to perform audit work outside the, of the audit plan if the director deems deviations are warranted, documented as required by the Texas Auditing Act, and presented to the board at its next scheduled meeting. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Oh, okay. A motion has been made. It has been seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. aye. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding purchases and contracts over a million dollars. I'd like to state for the record, I will be abstaining from consideration of this item. Ron Steffa will be presenting. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Chairman and members, Mr. Collier. You can find the list of purchases located behind tab H of your agenda book on page six. Uh, the first two purchases are increases to current contracts. The first one is lease of copier equipment that we use agency-wide. And the second is cellular telephone services with AT&T. The third item is a replacement contract for electronic monitoring services that are used uh, for specific parolees in the parole division. And it will be awarded to Atenti USA Inc. Uh, the next seven items are replacement contracts for residential reentry centers. Uh, they're located in DelVal, Dallas, El Paso, Fort Worth, Beaumont, and Houston. And these are our two-year contract. Um, and the two vendors are Core Civic and Geo Reentry Incorporated. And that concludes the items. I'll pause for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the board? And thank you, Mr. Steffa. Do I have a motion? I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the purchases and contracts over $1 million as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. A motion has been made. It has been seconded by Mr. Nichols. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Please let the record show I abstain from voting on the purchases and contracts over $1 million. Moving on to the budget. Over the last week, each board member reviewed with the TDCJ's finance leaders the, the details of the fiscal year 2021 proposed operating budget. These budget plans were a result of many months of preparation and numerous meetings with leadership offices on the needs of the department. The next item is discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding the TDCJ fiscal year 2021 proposed operating budget. Mr. Steffa, you may proceed. 
Thank you, Chairman. And I would again like to thank you for the time you took out of your busy schedules to attend those briefings. And as discussed during the committee meeting, the legislative appropriations request will not be included at this time, but we will bring that uh, back to you at a later date. Uh, the fiscal year 21 operating budget is based on the amounts appropriated by the 86th legislature. And it also reflects the reductions that were made as part of the agency's 5% reduction plan that was requested by state leadership in May in response to the economic impacts of the coronavirus pandemic. The agency appreciates the recognition and the exemption to the 5% of some of the critical areas within the agency to include correctional security, correctional managed health care, and behavioral health programs. The most significant items in the 5% reduction plan include the closure of two prison units, Garza East in Beeville and Jester One in Richmond, the idling of Bradshaw State Jail in Henderson, as well as not moving forward with the Correctional Information Technology System. For the biennium, the reductions total $122.9 million. And after the appropriate reductions are made to the budget, the FY21 agency operating budget totals $3.38 billion. And we will continue to closely monitor the agency's operational requirements and reduce costs where possible. We also look forward to continuing to work with state leadership as we continue to provide public safety during these challenging times and look ahead towards the legislative session. And I will pause for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Steffa. And again, thanks for all your hard work during these challenging times and particularly with no guidance yet to put together the operating budget. I just want to say on behalf of the board, we're very appreciative of you going beyond, over and beyond what you would usually expect. And this is just your first year too, that you have to work through the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So I very much appreciate all of your hard work. Are there any questions from the board? Yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Steffa, uh, I echo Chairman O'Daniel's comments, um, you know, to, to, to try to find places uh, to make reductions in these times um, is, uh, is, is no easy task, especially since uh, you and your team do such a great job of being stewards of the states and taxpayer uh, money. So just thank you for all the hard work you do. I know it's not easy and, um, and just wanted to say thank you for, for all of that. Thank you, sir. And, and Ron, I just wanted to add, thank you for being able to make those cuts and not impact staff reduction. So to me, I just thank you for that because these are critical <clears throat> times and it is important that we still uh, employ our staff, people who have been faithful and committed all these years. So I'm happy you were able to do that and we do not have to lay off anybody or terminate any position. So I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? If not, thank you, Mr. Steffa. Do I have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the Texas Department of Criminal Justice fiscal year 2021 operating budget as presented and authorize the executive director of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice to make transfers as necessary and as authorized through the General Appropriations Act and other applicable laws. A motion has been made. Uh, is there a second? Second. A motion has been made. It has been seconded by Pastor Miles. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. The next agenda item is the discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding proposed revision to BP 01.01 .01, Texas Board of Criminal Justice Responsibilities. Kristen Warman, General Counsel, will be presenting. Welcome, Ms. Warman. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairman O'Daniel, and thank you, board members. First is potential revisions to board policy 01.01 .01, Texas Board of Criminal Justice Responsibilities and the summary of the revisions is in your materials but for the record and the public viewing the meeting those revisions include removing language from section 
Roman numeral two, capital B, one K, requiring the parole division to supervise sex offenders under the supervision of a community supervision and corrections department as the governing administrative code was repealed. In addition to this language editing, the signature authority was revised and grammatical and formatting updates were made. Thank you, Ms. Mormon. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, uh, do I have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Faith Johnson here. I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the revisions to board policy uh, 01.01, .01, Texas Board of Criminal Justice Responsibilities as presented. I have a motion, is there a second? Second. Uh, a motion has been made. It has been seconded by Ms. Perryman. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. The next agenda item is the discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding proposed revision to BP 01.03, delegation of authority to manage the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Ms. Warman, please proceed. Yes, Mr. Chairman and board members, this policy is before you today to revise the signature authority and to consider revisions for grammatical and formatting updates. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Warman. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, we do have a motion. I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the revisions to board policy 01.03, delegation of authority to manage the Texas Department of Criminal Justice as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. A motion has been made. It has been seconded by Dr. Burrow. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. The next agenda item is the discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding proposed revision to BP 01.04 standards of conduct for the Texas Board of Criminal Justice and the Executive Director of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Ms. Warman, you may proceed. Yes, Mr. Chair and board members, board policy 01.04 is before you today to consider revisions to the signature authority and citations, as well as grammatical and formatting updates. Thank you, Ms. Warman. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, do I have a motion? I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the revisions to board policy 01 Point zero four standards of conduct for the Texas Board of Criminal Justice and the Executive Director of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice as presented. A motion is, uh, uh, I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. second? A motion has been made. It has been seconded by Mr. De Ayala. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. The next agenda item is the discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding proposed revision to BP 01.10, Texas Board of Criminal Justice Recognition Program. Ms. Warman, please continue. Yes, Mr. Chair and board members, Board Policy 01.10 is before you today to revise the signature authority and revisions for grammatical and formatting updates. Thank you, Ms. Warman. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the revisions to board policy 01.10, Texas Board of Criminal Justice Recognition Program as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. 
A motion has been made. It has been seconded by Ambassador Siv. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. The next agenda item is discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding a proposed land transaction involving a request for right-of-way easement at the Stiles Unit, Jefferson County, Beaumont, Texas. Bobby Lumpkin will be presenting. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Lumpkin. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairman O'Daniel, Mr. Collier, members. As was discussed during the Business and Financial Operations Committee, we have two items on the agenda. First item is the request for right of way easements at the Stiles Unit in Jefferson County. Jefferson County is requesting easements, which includes an area of less than half an acre for land for right of way to access that the county owns. Jefferson County has agreed to pay $5,000 for this easement with a 10 year term. It does include language requiring indemnification as the grantee's responsibility and the most favored nation clause. We recommend that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for right-of-way easements to Jefferson County. Mr. Lumpkin, thank you very much. Members of the board, I don't ordinarily vote unless it is to break a tie. However, my firm represents Jefferson County, which is included in the agenda item. I will not be taking action today on the request for right-of-way easement at the Stiles Unit, Jefferson County, Beaumont, Texas. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for right-of-way easement at the Stiles Unit in Jefferson County, Beaumont, Texas, as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, a motion has been made. It has been seconded by Judge Johnson. Are those, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Please let the record show I abstain from voting on the request for right-of-way easement at the Stiles Unit, Jefferson County, Beaumont, Texas. Mm -hmm. the, next, the next agenda item is discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding a proposed land transaction involving a request for electrical transmission line easement at the Monford Unit in Lubbock County, Lubbock, Texas. Mr. Lumpkin, you may proceed. Yes, sir. Encore Electric Delivery Company is requesting an easement, which includes an area of approximately 18.99 acres of land, being 7,389.46 feet long by variable width for two electrical transmission lines. This request includes temporary workspace totaling less than two acres. Encore Electric Delivery Company has agreed to pay $117,894 for this easement with a 10-year term. The easement does include language required indemnification as the grantee's responsibility, the most favored nation clause, and additional insurance in the amount of at least $2 million. We recommend that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for the electrical transmission easement to Encore Electric Delivery Company. Thank you, Mr. Lumpkin. Are there any questions or comments from the board? <laughs> Hearing none, do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for electrical transmission line easement at the Montford unit in Lubbock County, Lubbock, Texas, as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a, a, a motion has been made. It has been seconded by Pastor Miles. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this session regarding public comments, the Texas Board of Criminal Justice is committed to providing an opportunity for public presentations on posted agenda topics, as well as public comments on issues within its jurisdiction as provided in Board Rule 151.4. Persons interested in speaking at today's meeting were required to complete and submit the registration form provided in the posting of today's meeting by 5 p.m. on August 12, 2020. As stated at the beginning of today's meeting, no speaker registration forms were received by board staff prior to the required deadline. Therefore, no public comments will be heard on issues. Uh, 
I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And I remind you the next meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice will be Friday, October 30th at, and boy, we all need to pray for this, the Doubletree Hotel Northwest Arboretum in Austin. There being no further business, the 211th meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice is now adjourned. It is 1216. I remind everyone the Wyndham board meeting is at 1230.